Do you feel continually let down by modern media? Do you miss the good old days, back when all that mattered was a good story and not some agenda? Do you have ambitions of picking up a pen and pad and fighting the creative war yourself? Then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I'm going to talk to a creator who said enough is enough and started making the content they wished was out there. Join us as we discuss the ups and downs of the self-publishing world. We want to help empower you to join the Iron Age of media. Welcome to Iron Age Marketing. All right. Welcome, Richie Milling, to the Iron Age Marketing Podcast. How are we doing today? Oh, thank you very much for having me on. I'm doing all right. It's been a bit of a long day, but I'm uh, glad, glad to be sat down at last chatting with yourself. Good, good. So why don't we start this out the way we start on every podcast and we'll let the guests tell us a little bit about themselves and what's important about them. I don't think there's anything important about me. A <laughs> little bit of background info. So I've been writing for about seven years. And at the time when I began writing, I was working as a lawyer and I hated it. Worst, well, not a terrible job. I liked helping people with their legal problems, but it wasn't that much fun. So I decided to quit that job and try writing full time. Then I ran out of money after about six months. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go and work part time. So I took a job managing an Irish pub. Did that for three years alongside writing part time. And um, yeah, it, I think it paid off because I sort of got a little bit of a book deal with a small press in America. And then it's given me sort of opportunities to do like a podcast, which I, I host as well, called the Fantasy Writers Tool Shed, and like write short stories. I've developed my website. Um, and yeah, I've just sort of thrown myself in and I sort of live now by a philosophy that whenever I learn something new about writing or marketing, I pass it on. So that's what my website's for and that's what the podcast's for. I write books as well, like craft books. So I've got a book called The Fantasy Writers Handbook, which is probably the, the most popular book I've got. Uh, and that's just all advice and guidance and cr- cruel lessons that I've learned along the way. <laughs> well, if there's one thing I know is like someone who's into fantasy, it's that I think we all dream of ourselves being a fantasy writer someday. Yeah. You know, as indelibly as those stories have, you know, affect us personally and that feeling of being immersed in the world, you just want to be a part of that and give somebody else that same feeling. Yeah. I think that's that you've nailed it. Right. Um, my motivation for doing it anyway is I was reading all these brilliant books at a time when I was quite lost in life and I didn't know what direction to go I wasn't enjoying what I was doing and I was just reading loads of fantasy books and I think like you say they give you something especially at a time when you need it and it just inspires you to to do the same for other people and that's my main motivation for writing uh out of curiosity what was the the fantasy stuff that got you into it uh, is what did you start with what was your gateway so it was i don't know if you can relate to this but when i was a kid i was a voracious reader i used to read all kinds of hobbits was one of my favorite books growing up all the harry potter books they I, that was sort of my sort of generation's main book was harry potter mm-hmm. and then you go to university you get to the age of about 15 well, 16 17 i think when you start drinking <laughs> going out with friends and then you go to the university or college and then for me, writing just completely fell off the radar. It just wasn't something that I was in the forefront of my mind. And then, like I said, I started picking it up again. Um, got really into Raymond Feist, read all them books, the Riff War Saga. I think that's probably what got me back into fantasy and reading. And then Game of Thrones, that Song of Ice and Fire. They're some of my favorite books ever I've ever read. Like I th- There was one time when I was couldn't sleep one night. I think it was the third Game of Thrones book, which is split into two. And I think it was the second one. I started reading that about 1 a.m. And then next time I looked at me, watch, it was 8 a.m. <laughs> no book has ever sucked me in that much that I have completely been ignorant of the passing of time for seven hours as well. So, um, yeah, and I think that was what showed me the magic of writing and gave me this sort of desire to do the same. I want to give to people what books have given me. So yeah, them two, them two are the main books, I think. Have you ever read either of them yourself? Uh, no, not really, honestly. I'm actually more of a horror guy myself. Oh, so nice, like my people nice. are my people are, you know, Stephen King. Um, and more more importantly for me is Clive Barker. 
And Clive Barker was the guy that like really, really got me interested in writing. Because for for me, it's like it's one thing to do horror, but to write as well as he does. Yeah, definitely. While writing horror, like he just he's just had such a command of the language, and it just was super. There's that moment where it's deflating, and then the moment where it becomes inspiring. It's like God, I could never do this, but man, I want to try so bad. Yeah. It's funny that you talk about like you know falling off in your interest, you know, towards the end of high school and going off to uni. I know for me, like one of the reasons my kid is homeschooled is because I feel like the education system here in America certainly, like I I, I was a voracious reader as a kid. Like anything I could get my hands on, like all the classics, you know, Swiss Family Robinson, whatever it was. <laughs> nice. I I read The Dark Half by Stephen King when I was in fourth grade. I think just. Literally anything I could get my hands on and probably shouldn't have been reading in most cases. <laughs> but by high school, I'd completely given up reading. I don't think I hardly did it at all. And a lot of it, it was just the system just kind of made me hate the idea of learning. Hey, just why am I reading? Why am I reading books? And I, I, as an adult, and when I was going to college, got more into philosophy, kind of branched out into things that really interested me. It, it, it was dealing with certainly like, how how did it manage to do that? This thing that was so important and such a big part of my life for so long and it like destroyed it for me. So it's interesting to hear that. I think that's what the education system education system is designed to sort of it's all geared towards like maths and science and the creative subjects are just like way down the pecking order. I don't even remember being taught creative writing in school. I, I know I wasn't. <laughs> If it, if it was taught, it was taught so badly that I can't remember anything about it. <laughs> now, I, I will say, we definitely, at least over, I went to a very good high school in which we had a good arts program. And so I think technically my degree was in fine arts, but it was I was doing mostly sculpture and things of that nature. So it was really not like I didn't have my arts education. It just it tended to go somewhere else. We didn't have a great English program. I, I tell people my, my eighth grade English teacher decided to make my eighth grade English program a World War II history program. <laughs> and in particular, a, a let's see, let's just read about uh, Jews all year. And nothing against Jewish people, but it, uh, it was uh, not what I wanted to be doing for English class. I wanted more of a, a broader education, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what you mean, yeah. It's like, can we read something other than Eli Weissel and um, what's the girl in the attic? Uh, Anne Frank. Yeah, Anne Frank. Like, <laughs> just just something other than memoirs from World War Two, please. It's also a very bleak subject, you know. For you. I think with um with creativity, you have to sort of harness the enthusiasm for it. I think that's one of the most powerful things, and I think that's why a lot of writers, when they start, they're just like running on pure enthusiasm, and I I remember still having that and just like being so excited just to get home right and then create essentially and then somewhere along the line that enthusiasm gets volleyed in the balls and uh it's sometime about when the money runs out yeah, yeah when the money runs out yeah and you start thinking oh this is a waste of time um or you just don't feel like you're making any progress you're getting lots of rejections and you just kind of feel like you're never going to make it. It's the toughest lesson I've learned in writing is is to persevere and just remember why you do it. You do it purely for love and everything else is a bonus. I mean, that's definitely something we come back to on the show over and over again. It's the idea. It's like, if you love doing it, just keep doing it. Eventually, you're going to do the thing that hits or something that people really enjoy as long as you keep it. It's, I guess it's what we'd like it to is it's impossible to not get better or not get noticed if you do anything long enough. I think so, yeah. You've just got to work hard and, and trust that every word that you write and every story that you write is going to be better than the last. And I think a lot of people do get dejected by the marketing side of it as well because you might finish a book, which is a fantastic achievement, and then, then comes the marketing. And I think that's why this show that you've created is, is so brilliant because... It, it can spoil the experience for a lot of people because obviously they publish a book and then get absolutely no sales. And the reason we want to share that book with the world is people will read it and enjoy it. And if no one's reading it, then... And the thing about no sales is like, whatever, even if it... like Because there's plenty of people, like if you, they'll, they'll, when they put it up initially, they'll sell it for practically nothing. Give it a pay, pay $1 on Amazon for the book. Yeah. But they're, the thing that's more important than the money in that, it's just if sharing is something that is, is, is important to you, you get a dead set metric on how much you're sharing what you're doing. Yeah. And so no, nobody is experiencing this thing with me. My whole point was to try and have somebody experience it with me. You know, so you get a hard number saying, well, that didn't happen, buddy. So I don't know what to tell you. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm curious because you say you did marketing as part of your day job as well. You write SEO, and copy, things like that. Yeah. Do you think that marketing is as hard as I think people think it is? Or if it's you, if you can put together a few skills, like for, for me, like understanding podcasting and how to build an email list. Yeah. If you can do those two things, you can get a lot more traction than you would otherwise. But, and it's not even complicated to do it, but it does require constant effort. Like, you, yeah. you, don't, you can't just, oh, set up the email list, set up the page, and people will come to it. You have to write the emails to keep people interested and keep yourself in the inbox. You know, if you're going to do social media, you have to do it constantly because the algorithm doesn't care about you unless you're doing something daily and build up that expectation that people are going to look for it. Yeah. So it's it's more a matter from that I've seen of doing small work every day towards the larger goal. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, <laughs> a whole lot of big things. Like, yeah, you could get on one big podcast and it might pitch you to a lot of people and you might get a lot of traction that way. But then once that's over, it's over. T- taking the time to, you know, send the weekly emails to your list and build that relationship. Because sure, maybe they may not build buy this first book. One of the things I talked with, with J.B. Hilliard was that people are kind of leery to jump into a new author. You know, especially if someone like him, in his case, he's working in a four book series, he's two books in. And it's like, I think we all got burned by, you know, George. And, you know, when you don't finish the book series, you're right. Like, well, what was what did I invest all this time and energy in? So, you know, you want to build that trust and credibility with an audience. You do, yeah. A few really good points you made there. I think I decided to get focus more on marketing because I don't like the length of time uh, things take in the writing world. So you might write to an agent and then you might not hear nothing for nine months. What the hell do you do that time? So there's got to be a better way, a more efficient way to use things. So just as an example, short stories. A lot of people, when they're starting out, write loads of short stories, which is great. It's a great way to learn. And then you want to send them short stories out to publishers, boost your confidence, get a few publishing credits and stuff like that. So I've, I've done all that. But from like a, if you sort of take a step back and look at your long-term writing career and the aims that you want to achieve, how has this short story helped me do that? Base. Apart from like a little credit, it hasn't really helped me whatsoever. No one might read their magazines or like, I don't think anyone's emailed me after reading something I've had published in a magazine. I mean, to be fair, I've only had, I haven't had nothing published in big magazines, but it made me wonder whether there was a more useful way of using that short story. So I just turned it into like a reader magnet and started getting, I think for one short story, I think I got like over 600 email subscribers. Nice. Well, I was going to say, for me, like it, having a short story published, what it means is I've got an excuse to email people. Like that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, 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 if nothing else, I have something to email people about this week that, hey, go check this out. And, you know, yeah. it, 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 it builds that. But yeah, it, using it as a lead magnet is, is also a great use of it. Yeah. So I think when, when I started thinking of my writing as a business and I changed that mentality, that's when I started noticing significant improvements in the sort of monthly income. Um, so now everything I do, I all put all under the umbrella of the business. So podcasts and craft books, novels, websites, any sort of means of making income all gets funneled into this business. And it's amazing like when you start to break down what makes you money, what makes you the most money, and how can you make more money um, as quickly as possible so basically turn your writing into a job it's amazing like royalties probably one of the worst ways to make money (laughs) well when you can see what is actually making you money like in marketing the thing you focus on is like you might try four or five things that don't work at all yeah but if you find that one thing that does that one thing that has the roi and then you just throw all your money at that you put all your effort and time into that thing until it stops producing money. Maybe yeah, getting on this one big podcast does do good for you. Can you find more of them? Like, can you put more effort exactly, into that? Yeah. As opposed yeah. to, you know, like you said, you could send out uh, uh, short stories to a whole bunch of publications and it doesn't do you any good. Well, it's not doing you any good. 
you're going to write that stuff, so find a way to repurpose it in a way that will actually do good. Definitely. And then just also, like, not everything has to be only one thing. Like, one of the things you learn real quickly in, with podcasting, social media, is that, you know, one podcast can be a whole bunch of different things if you, you know, use it right. It, it can be turned into, you know, I've heard people turn good podcasts into ebooks. You know, run, run out the transcript, print it up, throw it on a PDF, and hey, give it a good fancy title that's going to draw attention. Yeah. That's a really good idea. You know, or you, you know, take that podcast episode, you break it up into the, you know, four or five minute clips that like are really hot, have something good, and just spam those out there. Yeah. And obviously, like you can get people to listen to the podcast, you're doing great, but you have to have a hook. You have to have something that kind of gets them into there beforehand. One of the things I've been getting more and more interested in, I've never actually seen any of these before, but uh, there's a lot of talk about trailers for books. Is that something you've ever gotten into yourself or any any interest in it? Yeah, I have made a book trailer once for the novel. Okay. Because when you work with an indie publisher, they don't have much of a marketing budget, so you basically do all the marketing yourself. And I made a trailer. So I'm not very good at these kind of things. So obviously you can get freelancers to do it. Um, if you're on a tight budget, then I think it is possible to do it yourself. But you do need quite, like I had to get my little brother to help me because he's more experienced in creating videos and stuff. So he used a piece of software, I can't remember the name of. But all we did was download a template of a trailer and just, like I say, repurpose it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm not not massively, they're really popular because something that we can sort of segue into here is the rise in video as a means of uh, marketing. So, like, I don't bother at all with social media. I hate it. I think it's so fickle. Well, we've gotten into a world where LinkedIn is my best social media account, and that just seems inappropriate. <laughs> I know. Well, LinkedIn's growing. LinkedIn's going to be one of the more stable so, uh, social media platforms, yeah? It's the only one I get, like, actual traction on. Facebook's absolute garbage. has been for years. Facebook's awful. Like, I used to use Facebook ads, and I got decent results out of that, but then it all went to down the potty. Twitter, awful. Instagram, unless you're sexy and you've got muscles, then waste of time. TikTok, never really bothered with it, but I don't really know how to make videos to do with writing for TikTok. TikTok is the one that everyone has said has been the best for like the past year or two. Yeah. I think that that's changing now because of cultural reasons, but that's one of the other issues. Like why marketing is a pain in the butt is because you kind of have to follow the trends to a certain degree. Definitely. Yeah. And like at least have a knowledge of where people are at. Yeah. Part of the reason TikTok was good is because it wasn't throttled like everything else is. There trying to get a foothold in the car culture so they weren't making you pay to use the service or to advertise like the content itself was the advertisement and as long as it was going out you were doing good but it, there is you're getting more people kicked off now for wild things i think uh everything sort of has a today doesn't it i mean tiktok is video based and like i was saying there just that video is something that i'm starting to focus more on so i've started to put more eggs in the youtube basket i think youtube's not going away and it's more established so that the algorithms are a bit more settled. And because it's tied to Google as well, there are a lot of benefits from like an SEO perspective. Out of curiosity, do you use any of the other video platforms? No, only YouTube. I only say that because uh, surprisingly, I get more traction on Rumble than I do on YouTube. Oh, nice. I've never used Rumble, to be honest, but YouTube has the most users, doesn't it? So oh, absolutely. Just, yeah. But, but I'll get like, you know, there'll be videos I'll get like seven or eight YouTube views on, and then I'll get 40 or 50 Rumble views on. And I don't know if it's maybe the more conservative audience scales towards the particular, you know, type of stuff I talk about. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be competition, though, because everyone's on YouTube, whereas there's probably less people using Rumble. Like, I, I hadn't even heard of Rumble. Absolutely, that too. So <laughs> I always say, though, if you've got content, get it on as many different platforms as possible and that's why i love podcasts because uh, it automatically aggregates it, yeah automatically you just press publish on one thing and then it goes out everywhere and you don't have to worry about it it's brilliant right on I, i'm curious if you have kind of like a like I, I one of my my lead magnets i have is i put out like a six month calendar oh cool like if you want to release a book these this is what i expect for the six months up to release well, technically it's the six months minus a week up to release day and then the week after you release the book and it's a lot of getting emails set up, building your list. It's, it's all geared towards doing that. Yeah. Do you? But do you have like something similar that you have for putting out your books, like your routine that you follow? 
Definitely, yeah. So email marketing was always a bit of a pain in the backside for me. I was like, I would spend time on it and I just wouldn't get the results that I wanted. People weren't really, not enough people were opening emails. And I, I'm someone who obsesses with like, well, 20% of people might have opened this, but what about the eight other 80%? How am I going to get to them? So I'm always looking to improve. So this is where I sort of went away and was looking at all different approaches. And then I ended up coming up with a bit of my own approach, which was based on my experiences managing the pub. Mm-hmm. And so I call it the pub landlord approach. And I this pub that I was running, it was on the verge of going out of business. It was in a pretty rubbish part of the city and it didn't look very pretty or appealing to go into. So when people did come in, I made a big deal of it. Like I would give them a free drink, free snacks, have conversations with them, try and like build a bit of a relationship with them. And they will come back for the relationships. And then before you know it, like people aren't bothered about how it looks or where it is as long as they're having a good experience when they're there. So I was like, analytically thinking, how the hell did I manage to do this sort of like these small interactions with people? And then how could I apply that to emails to achieve the same results? And that's all it was. It was just sort of building, playing a slow game for one. Email marketing is a long term. Yeah, absolutely. But it's sustainable. It's If you can nail your email marketing, you've got a business that's what I mean. It's like people are engaged, they're following you, they're clicking on your emails, they're opening your emails, they're replying to your emails, and that goes on. And as long as you keep emailing people, it'll carry on. Well, and an important thing that I think, especially people who are new to email marketing, would have to acclimate to is because you have different types of people in your audience, nobody opens the same same emails. Like most people don't open most of their emails. So if you're getting like 30% open rates on your emails, number one, you're doing pretty darn good. Now, click-through rate, once you, they've opened through, that's what you're usually really trying to get up is your click-through rate, is the email, the people that it's reaching. But each type of email might only reach one part of the segment of your audience. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it's just, that's how it's going to, like, some people like clickbaity titles. Some people clickbait titles just absolutely, you know, I no, no interest in whatsoever. Yeah. You know, and you might have more academically minded people like, hey, look at this interesting article about the future of fantasy novels, as opposed to some some people like might only respond to, hey, look at this piece of original fantasy I wrote. Yeah, yeah. You never know what's going to connect with who, and none of them will connect with everybody. Yeah. Well, I had a big problem with this because I realized that my, mark, my, my mailing list was basically divided between readers and writers. And I can't sell books to writers because they're not interested in my books. They're more interested in learning about writing. Um, so the segmentation side of things really did play a massive part. And now I have different reader magnets for different people. So if I'm sort of trying to get readers in, I'll offer them a free short book of short stories. If I'm trying to get writers in, I offer them a free craft book. And then emailing people based on and using automations for one, like that's one of the best things about email marketing is that you can just create it and it runs in the background and you don't have to worry about anything. So when I've properly segmented people, people are getting emails that they want to hear about. And then you build it up slowly. So obviously you give them something for free first, offer something of value, um, something that they want. And then I just try and get people into the habit of opening emails. Um, you don't necessarily have to click on things. Sometimes I'll just like send text in an email, being honest about my challenges of writing and stuff like that. And honestly, I've built this up and it's it's just people see me get like 40, 50% of people opening the first few emails and that keeps going up as that relationship grows stronger. Um, so now average email subscribe uh, average email open rate is probably 50 to 55 percent it's really strong email open rate yeah <laughs> that's good like, yeah but i never thought i would get to that i um i knew nothing about email marketing and it's only when i went away studied it all reflected on what i could actually do based on things that i've learned in real life and that's it's when i've started to get this approach so now i'm at the stage where i just need to scale it up and get more people opening the emails sending the emails out to more people and that that carries a cost because the more people you have on your mailing list the more money you've got to pay to manage that mail well that's why i think uh one of the, in my personal calendar for like a six month release schedule it has a weekly list clean out that you have to do to go and find out who's not doing anything who's just dead weight on here because absolutely anyone who's not not buying 
buying or at least not like showing like they're going to be buying anytime soon is a cost to you. Yeah, most definitely. And to refine your mailing list so that it's it, it's full of purely engaged people who are opening and, and clicking emails, you're just going to get even better results. That's the aim. Out of curiosity, how often do you email? So I try and I have a, a weekly, well, sorry, a bi-weekly newsletter for me writers and then a monthly one for readers. But when people first join, they will end, like go onto a, an automated system. So in them first few days, I want them to get used to me or getting emails from me. I want them to get used to seeing my name in their inbox. And I want them to get used to clicking on their emails as well. So in the first week, I'll probably send three emails and space it out. And then after the week, after the first three emails, I might do the next one four days later. And then the next one will be five days later. And then up until about seven days, and then our emails will go out once a week. So you gradually, you just get people used to receiving your emails and then you gradually just ease off. And then weekly, I think is a good one. But you can just keep them automations going forever. Like I think my at the moment, my automations like cover three months and then it, they'll people will just fall onto the bi-weekly newsletter or the monthly newsletter. Out of curiosity, do you, have, you play any type of games with people? when you're doing your emails like particular email guy I, I, email is the thing i'm very interested in <laughs> yeah it's cool i love email so i follow this guy daniel throssell i joke about it. it took me 24 hours to get onboarded to his email sequence oh really and in his onboarding sequence i had to download an app i had to there was at least 30 landing pages that i went through and maybe 50 emails something ridiculous why is that that's the way he had it set up, and most of it was telling you to, to you're, you're just going to be bothered by me, and I don't want that, so just don't go through this process. Go away. Oh, really? <laughs> but, yeah, I just but, think if you make it hard, it's, it's going to, people get bored and unsubscribe. The thing is, is in this particular instance, he's a, he is an email marketer, and so like, he's playing games that email marketers would find fun. I oh, thought it I was see. fun to go through this guy's horrible, absolutely terrible, and, you know, just... Oh my God, am I ever going to stop getting emails from this guy? But I was also interested to see where he was going with it. Like each email was interesting. Like he is a guy who's personally interested in, you know, nerdier stuff like us. And so it was actually set up where like you're getting these fun little anime characters with the emails. And a part of the app is you're picking up every, like every fourth email, you get like a new tool. And he was, it's doing it like a and d character building process going through this email sequence with him. Yeah. And you could do it in a in like I think maybe a week like normally, but like the way he sets it up is like you can go do this or you can skip to the next email as opposed to waiting for it. Oh, cool! And so you, you just kept wanting to skip to the next email to see like what's the where's he going with this? What's the next thing I'm going to get? And like I said, it's a joke. It took me tw- twenty four hours to like go through the entire process and get all of the emails that it would have probably normally taken like a month to get. But I wasn't waiting a month. I wanted to see the done things. That's a clever idea to do it, though. If I knew how logistically I was to sort that out, then yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing is, if you're like a professional copywriter who doesn't mind writing a lot of long form landing pages for very specific things, well, basically, we'll eat, like each landing page is pitching you some course that he's going to have inside and then some piece of the course that you get for free, uh, which brings me back. I was going to ask you real quick before we get too long here. I'm curious, do you have any kind of like a course or anything like that you teach on like how you utilize email marketing in what you do? Because if not, you should. I would love to send people to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, I uh, did a free workshop last November all about email marketing and I talk about this pub landlord approach and how I got high open rates and stuff and give examples of subject lines, preview lines, all all useful stuff. Um, so I think it's not free anymore. It's $9.99 on my website. I always keep my workshops really low to make them accessible to people. So yeah, I think it's just $9.99 and you can get it there. And I think it's about two hours. I mean, dude, if you're spending two hours on that topic, nine ninety nine is way, way worth what that would give you yeah. in useful skills moving forward. <laughs> I think you're not charging enough, frankly. But I know I don't charge enough, but <laughs> that's me who's more on the marketing side, not the not the books. <laughs> I know that's why I do them for free, though, to give people a chance to learn for free, and then I just like to make things accessible to people. I'm from a pretty working class background, and obviously, you denied a lot of opportunities that other people don't and lucky to get and i don't want anyone to feel like the priced out of anything so i just keep prices as low as possible make things free well in an effort to keep my episode short i want to <laughs> call it right now but i don't really want to call let's put it that way um i would love to have you on again sometime to you know 
talk about some other aspects that we just kind of, you, you drew me to the e the email place. And I just wanted to ask so many questions about that in particular. I love email marketing and it's, it's such a niche area. I don't really get a chance to speak to many people about it. Well, it's such a personal thing. Like it, it, very few ways in publication do you get to go directly to the client. Yeah. You know, you're trying to reach everybody at once which with email, with segmentation and things like that. You can really tailor it in. I mean, one of the first rules you're going to be told is if you're writing an email, never write as if you're writing to a bunch of people. Always write as you're writing to one person. Definitely. Because psychologically, you don't know any better. You're just reading email. You want it to look like it was an email written from your friend. That's what you want. Like, that's why they'll, they'll tell you, don't worry about grammar. The, the better it looks, almost the, the worse it looks because it, it tells them, oh, this is marketing. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> if you want one last little tip based like related to this point what i've got set up as like a, a it's like a plain text email so it just looks like i've just fired off a personal email and that goes out a half an hour after someone joins the main list and it, it could i just say like this is what i would genuinely say to every single person who would join um i just don't have the time to do it <laughs> it's just like thank you so much for joining i really appreciate it and then that's it basically so i just say tell me a little about yourself i was gonna say you gotta ask a question in there right you want to start that that relationship and the give back exactly yeah but it comes across as like i've literally just emailed this i've seen this person join the mail list and i've emailed them and that's what i want it to be like and not everyone replies we get quite a lot of replies and that's when i get the opportunity to email back and forth and i think that email in particular gets about 60 percent and open rate and maybe a 10 15 percent click rate well, and I can't imagine the data that you get from that, from people actually responding to you. And even if it doesn't happen much, like they, your, your client avatar, as we would call it, you're going to get a much better vision of what that looks like if you have actual written responses from people. I just like engaging with people and just like making friends with new people from all over the world. And yeah, it's all good. Well, you got a new friend in Ohio here, boss. So oh, it's, nice. it's, it's working out for you. Uh, same, same for you in Liverpool, where Clive Bach is from as well. <laughs> Why don't you tell everyone where they can go and check you out, learn more about you? Yeah, best place to go is my website, which is richiebilling.com. That's B-I-L-L-I-N-G. Podcast as well, if you like writing fantasy, that's the fancy writers tool shed at gmail. Uh, fancy writers tool shed at gmail. It's all the fancy writers tool shed. And yeah, we do a bit of book marketing on there. Not an awful lot, but we we will be doing more, I'm sure. We'll have to have yourself on, Nicky. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah, definitely. I'll have the tables turned on me and ask me ridiculous questions. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on today, Richie. It, it, it's I I love being able to bring real high intensity marketing information to people that I don't think generally get exposed to it, but who it's super super important to that they have this. Yeah, because over here in the states, like we have kind of a takeover of our media by people who hate the people that normally read those particular genres and. I want to encourage as many people like if look if the entertainment you want isn't being made then go make it yourself definitely you know that's that's an opportunity it's not a bad thing they they want to make their entertainment let them make it we make our own yeah and have fun in the process as well oh absolutely well thanks very much for having me on and i really love that you've made this podcast because it's so important and a lot of people need help and this is what this does so thanks very much do you fancy yourself the next tolkien Lewis or Barker? Maybe you just have something subversive to say. Hopefully this podcast is helping you, but maybe your ambitions are just a little bigger than you can handle on your own. Head over to ironeedsmarketing.com and let Nikki P help ensure your book doesn't release to nobody.